The scripture for this morning comes to us from the New Testament, the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. Romans, chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, and I will read the word of God for you. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, this morning we would like to think about what comes in between suffering and perseverance, between perseverance and character, and between character and hope. Sometimes these transitions seem hard and impossible with our own powers, but Lord, how comforting it is to have the Holy Spirit as our guidance. Please speak to us as we look into your word this morning. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So our passage, Romans chapter five, begins with the word, therefore, meaning that it's summarizing what Paul wrote down before chapter five, right? So if we look at the closest chapter, which is chapter four, Paul talks about how Abraham believed in God and his promise and it was credited to him as righteousness. We actually looked at this passage the week before on Easter morning. Now, at the end of chapter four, Paul also mentions that this is not only for Abraham, but also for all of us who believe in Jesus, our Lord, who was raised from the dead. So when Paul says, therefore, here, he is deeming the faith that we hold in our hearts, given to us by God as a gift, and the fact that because of this, this faith that we have, we can now have peace with God and can walk in grace with our eyes fixed on hope. Now this sounds just about right for those who call themselves Christians, right? It's our story. But when we are actually out there going through our day-to-day -day lives, you know, we find out that our faith will actually collide with tension instead of peace, despair instead of hope, and disgust instead of love. So meditating on our passage for today, my initial question was, how do the believers go from suffering to perseverance, perseverance to character, and character to hope? Does it actually work this way? If so, how do we do this well? What's the driving force behind these three transitions that we see here? And let's look at them one by one. And the first that we just read is suffering to perseverance. Suffering to perseverance. Now, the original word for, for the word suffering is philipsis, which can be defined as, as a pressing or pressing together or pressure. That's the original meaning. Metaphorically, this word means oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, and straits. Now please think with me here. How do you usually respond to oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, and straits? I don't know about you, but the usual response in here for me is usually doubt, depression, denial. Oh, and this is a regular here, anger. 
And to be very honest with you, it seldom connects to the word perseverance. But the Bible here is telling us, hey, whenever oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, and streets come your way, respond with steadfastness, endurance, and even praise. That's what the Bible is saying. But how? There has to be something that comes in between. Our suffering doesn't just go straight to perseverance right away. So what's happening here in between? And you know, when I was thinking about this, an image popped up in my head. You know, do you know the word threshold? Threshold? Well, in the dictionary, it says a threshold is a strip of wood, metal, or stone forming the bottom of a doorway and crossed in entering a house or room. So now you get the, the, the mental picture of what a threshold is, right? So it's a, it's a contact zone where two spaces meet. In Korean, I, I believe the word is munchibang, munchibang, right? And I don't usually step on the threshold when entering a room from another room. What do you do? You usually walk over it like it, it's, it's not there. So your, your transition from one room to another room is very swift, almost as if nothing exists in between. But what if I were to stand on the threshold whenever I entered a room? I know it sounds a little foolish here, but a little weird, but what if, what if I took time to stand on it intentionally and consciously and just stopped for a moment to think about the transition that I'm making from one room to the other room. You know, I believe when we can start doing that, a threshold is not just a divider of two spaces, but it's a zone of possibility, a zone of meditation, and a zone of remembrance. For instance, let's talk about rooms in our hearts now. Let's say that you were going about your day, something happened, you didn't like it, and you were stressed out about it. Before stepping into the room of anger and depression and stress, how about standing on the threshold for a while? Maybe make a slow transition over to another room. How about that? And this is very hard for me to do. It's a challenge for me always, but I'm asking you and also myself to, to try this out. Try it out a little more in our lives. Standing on the threshold. You know, if you watched uh, Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ, it was Easter right before, right? So if you watch this film, you would know very well that this movie talks about, shows the 12 hours of Jesus' life, the last 12 hours of Jesus' life. Now in that film, I remember this one scene that has no words, but uses only slow motion footage to, to capture the moment of Jesus' encounter with Mary in the book of John chapter 8, Mary Magdalene. The scene begins in the courtyard where, where, where Jesus has been mocked by the Roman soldiers. And Mary Magdalene leans over to Jesus to, to wipe his blood off the stones. As she, you know, crawls on her hand and knees weeping because Jesus is being tortured, Mary remembers a time when she was on her knees in another courtyard a while back. Now the scene flashes back to a crowded, dusty courtyard. So she's thinking about another time. An angry crowd of Pharisees approaches with stones in their hands. Before the mob can get near her, the camera pans out at ground level to show a hand 
draw a deep line in the sand. It's Jesus' hand. The camera pans back further to show Jesus now riding in the sand and the crowd, what happens? Slowly drop their stones and leave the scene. As Jesus stands, Mary Magdalene, her hands reach out towards Jesus' feet from where she lies on the ground because she was about to be stoned. As she comes to her knees, Jesus graciously reaches out and pulls her up. Jesus looks at her with forgiving eyes. Then the scene switches back to Mary in the courtyard of stones with tears streaming down her face as she wipes Jesus' blood. What's happening here? What just happened here? Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, I believe this shows how powerful it is to hold the image of Jesus in our hearts when we are going through tough times. Jesus in our past, in our memories, will empower our lives of today so that we can face the future with hope. In that sense, the transition from suffering to perseverance is only possible if we were to touch upon the grace that we've received. And it's an area where we need God's touch. We, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it with our powers. We can't do it with our own will. We have to accept the fact that it's not by our own will and power that this transition will be possible. It's possible only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amandissa Hundley, I don't know if you um, saw this online, but she's a gospel singer and one of the 12 finalists on the TV, TV show called American Idol. She's a gospel singer, right? And she was meeting with the judges. Um, they have three judges, right? Cowell, Abdul, and Jackson to find out if she made it to the next round of competition, right? Now, Simon Cowell had previously made a very sarcastic remark about Mandissa and her body size. Uh, he commented on her by saying, do we have a bigger stage this year? A very, you know, not, it, it's not an you know, acceptable comment, right? But he said it. She, she heard that. Later, when she entered the room to find out if she made it, Mandissa looked right at Simon the judge and said this to him. These are her words. Simon, a lot of people want me to say a lot of things to you, but this is what I want to say. Yes, you hurt me, and I cried, and it was painful. It really was. But I want you to know that I've forgiven you, and that you don't need someone to apologize in order to forgive somebody. And I figure that if Jesus could die so that all of my wrongs could be forgiven, I can certainly extend that same grace to you. I just wanted, to know, I just wanted you to know that. To this, another judge, Randy, said amen. And Simon, who made the sarcastic remark, he apologized right away. And Mandissa advanced to the next round. Why am I telling you this? Well, I think it relates to where we're going with this scripture. Mandissa chose to stand on the threshold. And instead of choosing to return the sarcasm with her own sarcasm or anger, she chose to remember who she was and how she was treated by Jesus. And she stepped into the room of forgiveness and kind words. She made that choice. Something for us to think about. Let's continue on to the next one, which is perseverance to character. Perseverance to character, right? The original word for this word, character, has somewhat different nuance than this translated word. So we have to look into it. The word dokime, which is defined as proving something through trial, 
something that is approved after being tried many times, and a specimen of tried worth. In other words, you cannot just go from perseverance to character right away. There is a process of going through trials after trials after trials and proving your perseverance many, many times. Again, that, that in-between space, stepping on that threshold again and again. The Bible makes it sound so easy, but the truth is, if we look at our lives, this is just so hard. Is it just hard for me? I mean, don't you have that moment where you go, I can't fight this fight. Not again. I can't persevere in this situation. I'm angry. I can't go on like this. I have no power whatsoever to make something good out of this. You know, almost every week, I struggle with these voices in my head. Dear brothers and sisters, please do hear the voices of the authors of the Bible written out together with the work of the Holy Spirit. When you are in struggle, when you are going through these countless numbers of perseverance, don't pay attention to the voices of the world or yourself. Pay attention to what the Bible says. Let me just give you a few uh, scripture uh, pieces for you to take home. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. John chapter 16, verse 33. I have, this is Jesus' words. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So James said it. Peter said it. Paul said it. And Jesus said it. They all went through countless numbers of trials and tribulations just like us. Oh, but what was their response? Perseverance in faith all the way. For the Spirit of God was with them. They were able to finish the race with God. That reminds me of the song that I really love. And the chorus part goes something like this. And I will run to you, to your words of truth, not by might. Not by power, but by the Spirit of God. Yes, I will run the race till I see your face. Oh, let me live in the glory. Continue this race of going from perseverance to character. Amen? And lastly, let's look at character to hope. This is another story here. 
You know, I believe now you sort of get where I'm going with this. Character, your character, will not necessarily lead us right to hope. It's not automatically that way. Even if you've proven yourself to be a person of perseverance, standing in faith, standing in grace, that doesn't just directly connect you to the joyful, confident expectation of eternal salvation in Jesus. No. Why is that? Why? It's because your expectation of good will always be met by the systematic evil of this world. Christians are meant to be a people of hope, right? But when we live in this system of evil, and when we see our hopeful efforts being turned into naught again and again, it's very likely that we will wake up one morning and say to ourselves, that's it, I've had enough. Hope, whatever that is. But God is encouraging us again today. Keep going, my child. Keep hoping and keep going from suffering to perseverance to character and hope when everyone turns their backs to me. Will you please stand there facing me with hope? I read this um, story this, this week. A woman who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness called for her pastor to talk about her final wishes in life. And after discussing about her funeral service in advance, she, she added that um, she wanted to be buried with a fork in her right hand. A fork in her right hand. That was her wish. So, so the minister, he, he was curious. Why a fork? He asked. And the woman answered, well, since my childhood, when I was sitting at the dinner table and the dishes from the main course were being cleared, my mother would often tell me to keep my fork. Now, when she said that, I knew something sweet and savory, something better and wonderful was coming. Now, I want people to see me in that casket with a fork in my hand and wonder, what's with the fork? And you, minister, will tell them that she was expecting something sweeter and better because the best is yet to come. What an amazing lady and what an amazing story, right? Dorothy West once wrote, If the best is yet to come, the present will blend with it beautifully. Let me say that once more. If the best is yet to come, the present will blend with it beautifully. Amen? You know, our job as children of God is to blend the present with hope here and now, come what may. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Easter was just around the corner, and I pray that we didn't forget that already and what you've done for us. And with that precious memory of ours, we stand on the threshold so that we can advance from suffering to perseverance, perseverance to character, and character to hope. Meet us in the in-between spaces and strengthen us so that we can continue our journey of faith. Let us fill the interstices with you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.